Our next speaker is Dr. Justine Dowd. She's a postdoctoral fellow working in the health and wellness lab at the University of Calgary. Justine's passion for gut health began with the diagnosis of celiac disease just as she was beginning her PhD. An active health promoter, Justine's work has been published in numerous health journals and presented at the Canadian Celiac Association's national and regional conferences, the Society of Behavioral Medicine Conference, and the International Celiac Disease Symposium. Justine also co-created the My Healthy Gut app, which makes it easy for any individual to improve their general digestive health, in addition to providing tips and tools for managing celiac disease or gluten intolerance. Justine, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Just trying to get this screen share up. Okay, you can see that now? I'm assuming yep. yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. As Mark mentioned, my name is Justine, and today I'll be talking about holistic strategies to managing stress and anxiety uh, during a pandemic. My talk will be a bit different than other talks today, as it's meant as more of a workshop. And so you'll have an opportunity to actually practice the uh, activities that I lead you through. Um, today. And my hope is that you'll be able to have some takeaways that really start to help you with managing stress and anxiety on a go forward basis. So if you haven't already pulled up the worksheet that was emailed to you, please do that now. Um, and if you can't access it, no worries, just a piece of paper and a pen will be great. And if you don't have that, you can just go through them in, in your head as well, whatever is easy for you. I uh, will be giving you time to stop to uh, complete the activities, but I do encourage you to set time later um, to come back to any of the activities that resonate for you and practice them further um, down the road. I'd like to thank the CCA for inviting me to be a part of today. It truly is a pleasure to be a part of today's conference. A uh, big thank you to Mark and Melissa and everyone who worked so hard to put this event together online. Um, it's, it's really wonderful for everyone to be able to participate across Canada now. So as we get started today, I'd like to invite you all to take three deep breaths. Just wherever you're sitting, just getting comfortable. And just noticing the air coming in and out of your mouth. And just letting yourself be here now. And now ask yourself, what is something that you're struggling with? What's causing stress or anxiety as a result of COVID? Maybe it doesn't have to do with COVID, that's okay. Just whatever it is that comes to mind first. And you can write it down on the sheet there. And making sure you choose something that uh, you feel comfortable thinking about in this setting. So something that's kind of a mild to moderate level of stress or anxiety. And then once you've written that down, just taking a moment to reflect on what the best part of COVID-19 has been for you. Often I've heard a number of different silver linings that people have found. So just take a moment to reflect on what that's been for you. Now I'd like to start by sharing a little bit more about my health journey um, and where my interest in a holistic approach to uh, celiac disease comes from. So I was diagnosed with celiac disease almost a decade ago and I've been through a number of ups and downs myself in trying to heal my gut and managing celiac disease. Became complicated with Hashimoto's hypothyroidism and irritable bowel syndrome. I had often been in so much pain that I'd have to lie down on my office floor until the pain passed. I also struggled with fertility for over two years and it turned out that my fertility issues were tied to my gut health. And we ultimately found our answer when we found a doctor who specialized in autoimmune infertility. Um, and you can learn more about that that's on my new book that uh, you can access through my website. So in learning to cope with my health struggles, I became interested in Kristen Neff's work on self-compassion and mindfulness. She helped me personally, and then it also really inspired the work that I've done um, in people with celiac disease and exploring the role of self-compassion and helping people to cope with this. So through all of these experiences, I've become very passionate about my own gut health and helping others to optimize their gut health. So today I'll be talking about holistic strategies to managing stress and anxiety. And I believe that mindset truly is the foundation um, to establish, to having a well-being during stressful times. And we'll be talking about that uh, to begin with today. But I also believe, especially for people with celiac disease, that a nutritious gluten-free diet is essential to coping well. 
as well as getting sufficient sleep and engaging in regular physical activity. So these are the components that we'll be talking about today and coming up with strategies as to how you could start to incorporate um, more of this into your life. So now I'd like you to think about a time when a close friend or a loved one was feeling really badly about him or herself and they were really struggling. How did you respond to your friend? What sort of things did you say to them? And how did you try to make them feel? Maybe just making a mental note of the tone of voice that you used. And again, how you're trying to make them feel. And now thinking about a time when you felt badly about yourself and you were really struggling, how did you or how do you typically respond to yourself? And how does it typically make you feel? Taking just a moment to reflect on the tone of voice you use. And again, what is it? How does it end up typically making you feel? And now just reflecting on the differences, the similarities and differences between how you treat others and how you treat yourself. And my guess is that most people will notice that they're much more kind, compassionate, empathetic, and patient with other people than they are with themselves. And if you resonate with this, don't worry, you're totally normal. The majority of the population is much kinder to other people than they are to themselves. And so when I saw this, I thought it spoke well to this idea. This girl says, I never thought I was a bully until I listened to how I speak to myself. I think I owe myself an apology. Because unfortunately, being so tough on ourselves can lead to long-term suffering and struggling. As I'm sure many of you are probably aware, feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, and loneliness are very common in society today. And these feelings are particularly heightened due to the given the new stresses of COVID-19 and affecting numerous areas of our lives. So in order to feel your best, it's essential to make sure that you make time to take care of yourself. If we get overwhelmed, these feelings can be so strong and debilitating that they prevent you from accomplishing what you want in life, in school, work, relationships, and then they can even cause uh, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal issues to flare up. But fortunately, self-compassion has been shown to help with this. So what exactly is self-compassion? It is simply giving the same kindness that we, to ourselves that we would give to others. So that's why I like starting with that first activity and, and asking you to reflect on, on how you treat others. And the researchers have broken it down into three key areas. So this idea of self-kindness rather than self-judgment. So this refers to the, uh, our inner voice and what sort of things we say to ourselves and how it makes us feel. Common humanity rather than feeling isolated. So when we practice self-compassion, we remind ourselves that we're not the only ones in the world that are feeling this way, rather than feeling so isolated and thinking we're the only person who's ever been in this situation before. And finally, in, uh, practicing mindfulness versus over-identification. And when we practice mindfulness, it refers to the way that we relate to our experiences with non-judgment and acceptance. So when I talk about self-compassion, particularly with celiac groups, I like to share examples of uh, when I've had to practice this, particularly um, in coping with my celiac disease. So I have not been gluten too many times, but I definitely had a couple of pretty bad experiences. And uh, one was about two years ago. Um, and I was at a health club and I thought that the bowl that I was getting, it was labeled gluten-free um, and it had vegetables and then some soba noodles. And um, I should have triple checked, but I didn't. And uh, the soba noodles were not gluten-free and I was extremely sick that afternoon. Um, and so then when I was lying in my bed afterwards, I was just in so much pain. My stomach was just on fire and I just wanted to sleep, um, but I was so uncomfortable. And as I was lying there and just feeling so mad and frustrated and awful, I started to notice what was going on in my mind. And as someone who teaches self-compassion, it's, uh, I was surprised to see that um, I was inc being incredibly hard on myself. I was saying, oh, how could you let this happen? You're so dumb. Why did you eat that? Why didn't you triple check it? And I was really being hard on myself here. And so I realized this probably wasn't helping my situation. And I took a step back and I started to just give myself this self-compassion and say, okay, I can see this has been really awful. You've been glutened and you feel extremely sick. I'm so sorry that you're going through this. This is really difficult. And I just started to be kind to myself and it started to feel a tiny, tiny little bit better. 
Um, and then I started to practice this idea of common humanity rather than feeling isolated. So I reminded myself that I'm not the only celiac in the world who has been glutened before. And as easy as it can be to feel that, that way at some time um, when we feel sick, remind yourself that accidents happen and you're not the only person that that's happened to. And then this third piece, the mindfulness, um, I also realized after I was practicing these first two that then my brain started going to trying to make sure this never happened again. And the letters I was going to write to the sports facility and um, everything I was going to do to make sure this never happened. And then I started to feel the pain coming back and, and feeling worse again. And I realized that I really needed to come back just to the present moment. And I really was focusing on my breathing and trying to relax. And I started to feel better. And I was just trying to practice that mindfulness piece of being here and accepting where I was at with non-judgment and acceptance. So I hope that that um, example illustrates what these three pieces of self-compassion um, entail, particularly for people with celiac disease. And we'll go through um, some more meditations as, as we go. But a key piece that I really want to uh, make clear on this, on this page here is that we practice self-compassion not to feel better, but because we feel bad. And I know that can kind of feel, sound a little bit counterintuitive, but this is really important to know because if we start practicing self-compassion to make feelings go away, it actually stops working. But if we practice self-compassion to give ourselves compassion because we feel crummy, we're suffering or in pain, saying things like, ah, I'm so sorry. Is there anything I can do to help? And just really trying to soothe and comfort yourself. That is how self-compassion helps us cope during difficult times. So let's take a moment for a mindfulness break now. And this is a really simple strategy that you can use if you're feeling triggered, if you're feeling anxious or stressed out um, for any reason. And so again, just sitting comfortably in your chair, you can close your eyes or leave them open, whatever feels right to you. And just turning your attention to your breathing and just taking three nice and slow, deep, long breaths. If you're noticing your mind going off different places, that's okay. Just gently bring it back to the breath. Once you're done, you can write down how you're feeling on how that made you feel and if you what you noticed on the worksheet there. So now let's talk a little bit about why there's this strong gut-brain connection. Why is it that the mindset components can actually help our gut? And so it's because we have uh, the gut-brain connection through the vagus nerve. And so it's called the wandering nerve because it has multiple branches that diverge from two thick stems that are rooted in the brain stem. And they wander throughout the body. They touch on the heart, lungs, and digestive tract, and they're known as the superhighway. It's the connection between the gut and the brain. And what's really interesting here is that it's bi-directional. So this is why when we're emotionally upset, often we feel physical symptoms in our guts, nausea, upset stomach, that sort of thing. But it also works the other way too. If our guts are upset from food or underlying issues, it can impact our mental health. And there's this really strong connection between gut health and mental health. But today we're focusing on how stress can actually impact our guts. And in today's society, we have very high levels of stress and anxiety. And the stress leads to heightened activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So the body can't focus on rest and digest. And this leads to potentially long-term digestive health issues. So what can we do? So we have two options. We can reduce the stress that we feel, oh, uh, which would be ideal. And I'm, my guests uh, encourage you to think about if there's ways that COVID-19 has helped you in simplifying your life. I know there's many awful and, and terrible things that have happened as a result of it, um, but there have also been a lot of ways that I think people's lives have been, been simplified as well. And so thinking about ways that um, you might learn that you can take away after this in order to reduce that stress that you feel long-term. Um, however, we're not going to be able to get rid of all the stress that we feel. So we also want to come up with strategies to help us cope with the stress. And so that's what I'm going to be talking further about today. And bef 
before, I want to share a little bit more about the research. So this was a study that was done um, about seven years ago. And so it was a really neat program. It was an intensive eight week mindful self compassion program where people were encouraged to practice uh, mindful self compassion on a daily basis. And they found that after this program, um, that there were significant improvements in self compassion, you can see in the red here, the people who participated in the um, intervention group had improvements in the self-compassion piece, mindfulness, life satisfaction, and significant reductions in depression, anxiety, and stress. And what's really neat about this study, and typically in behavioral interventions, we don't see this, is that these, uh, these positive changes were actually sustained six months after the intervention and one year after the intervention. Typically, we see some changes after the program, and they often tend to fizzle out. Um, but we also saw that life satisfaction continued to go up at one year. So the big takeaway from this is this study is that it's this regular practice of self-compassion that can really lead to all these different uh, benefits in terms of our mental health and coping with stress. So this study inspired uh, this and numerous other studies inspired me to um, apply for some funding from the CCA and I was awarded this a couple of years ago. Um, and then I wanted to look at how self compassion affects people who are coping with celiac disease. So maybe some of you uh, participated in this online study people were asked to complete the questionnaire at two time points. Um, separated by one month and then we analyzed the results and we found that self-compassion directly predicted adherence to a gluten-free diet and it also indirectly predicted adherence to a gluten-free diet through this concept called self-regulatory efficacy and essentially this is just our confidence in our, in our abilities to self-manage our behaviors to follow gluten-free diet so this is really interesting because it provides an air, a way that we can help people with actually coping with making this massive change to our life and following a gluten-free diet and teaching people how to be more self-compassionate. And then we also looked at how um, self-compassion helps in terms of quality of life. Of course, adherence is really important, but how do people actually feel? How are they coping on a day-to-day -day basis? And again, we found that self-compassion directly predicted celiac at a specific quality of life and it indirectly predicted it through this idea of concurrent self-regulatory efficacy. So I know that's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially that's someone's confidence in their abilities to manage multiple valued life goals. So for example, for someone with celiac disease, you might have the multiple valued life goal of uh, pre-COVID, being able to go out and eat with uh, family or friends, but this also can be tough with someone with celiac disease. And so your confidence in your abilities to follow gluten-free diet and manage your disease, but also be able to get those social interactions uh, combined to affect your quality of life. And again, showing here that self-compassion, the more that we practice this, the better able we are to have a higher quality of life and also manage those multiple valued life goals. So this was a neat study because it was the first theory-based study to investigate the effects of self-compassion and some of these other self-regulatory um, thoughts in people with celiac disease and suggest some potential ways that we can help people in terms of adherence and quality of life. And so this motivated me um, in terms of future research that I was, have been doing. Um, and so it was to, I ran the Power C study. It was an online program and we're just analyzing the findings to look at how self-compassion helps people who are newly diagnosed with celiac disease. So stay tuned. Hopefully next year I can uh, update you on those findings. Um, and then I'm also starting a program on Tuesday, May 12th. This is a free online program and I'll talk more about it at the end, but it is going to be um, teaching people self-compassion and, and helping you to cope with stress and anxiety during uh, COVID. So going back to this idea of mindfulness for a little bit again, um, mindfulness is the way that we observe our experiences with non-judgment and acceptance because what we resist persists. I encourage you to think about a time that you were struggling with some sort of thing emotionally, um, psychologically, and it was bothering you. My guess is that if you were trying to push it away and not feel it and just not wanting to deal with it, the more that you were pushing it away, the more that it persisted. So we can think of this as when we meet pain with resistance, that is what leads to suffering. But what we can feel, we can heal. 
So now we'll take an, a moment to go through what I call a self-compassion break so that you can actually see how you could um, use this approach to actually feel these feelings and, and cope with them. So again, I invite everyone to close their eyes and take several deep breaths. And bringing to mind what's bothering you, what you wrote down from the beginning. Maybe it's from COVID-19, maybe it's just some other things in life, whatever it is. And just really trying to bring that to mind so that you can feel the discomfort that this thinking about this leads to in your body. Where do you feel it the most? Some people feel it deep in a pit in their stomach. Some people feel a racing heart, tight chest, tight shoulders, maybe a clenched jaw or a busy brain, busy mind jumping all over the place. Wherever you notice it, just notice how you're feeling and try to make contact with the sensations as they arise in your body. And now say to yourself, this is a moment of suffering. So this is being mindful. You can also say, this hurts, this is really tough. Suffering is part of living, it's part of common humanity. Everyone feels discomfort at some point in time. And now take your hand and place it over your heart. Feel the gentle pressure and warmth of your hand. Feel free to place both hands on your chest, noticing the difference between one and two hands. Now, some people feel uneasy with their hands on their heart, so feel free to explore other possibilities, such as crossing your arms to give yourself a gentle squeeze. And now say to yourself, may I accept myself as I am? May I give myself the compassion that I need? May I forgive myself? May I be strong? May I be safe? these words don't feel right to you, think of what you might say to a close friend or a loved one who is struggling. May I accept myself as I am. May I give myself the compassion that I need. May I forgive myself. May I be strong. May I be safe. If these words don't feel right to you, think of what you might say again to that friend or loved one and just noticing how you feel. This is part of what is involved in being self-compassionate. And it's a basic way of giving yourself love in the form of soothing touch. You can feel free to stay this way as long as you like. So this is an example of something, um, an activity that, or a strategy that you can use on a regular basis, as much or as little as, as you find it helpful. Um, for example, in, in the morning before I start work, it's something that I use to help me get grounded and to really stay focused for the day. So before I start working, I sit down at my desk and I take anywhere from 30 seconds to five minutes to just simply go through this, ask my body how I'm feeling. Sometimes this can also be really a helpful strategy if you're feeling triggered by something, if something's causing you to feel stressed or anxious, this is a really great way to just take a step back. And even if you only have 30 seconds, it can be really helpful to just tune in and give yourself that self-compassion and, um, and exploring which way it feels good. If it's your hands on your heart or wherever you put those hands um, can be really helpful. Um, and then I also like to say here that if you are someone who felt, um, if this actually didn't feel great, if it made you feel a little bit uneasy, don't worry, you're totally normal. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong, it means that you're doing it right. Um, and it's this idea called backdraft. And so I was really lucky to hear Dr. Kristen Neff, uh, the expert in this, talk about it in Calgary two summers ago. And she talked about this idea saying that um, if you think about a house that's on fire, if the flames, um, Come. If you open the front door, the oxygen comes rushing in and the flames come rushing out. And so that can happen with our emotions. If for years we've been trying to push them down or push them away, if we finally give ourselves the opportunity to sit and uh, feel these feelings, sometimes they can feel like a lot and feel really uncomfortable. But again, you're not, uh, it doesn't mean you're doing it wrong and it, there's nothing wrong with you. It just means that you're feeling these things. And if they're really, really intense, I encourage you to reach out to a healthcare professional because there are so many wonderful ones that can help you to sort through and process those feelings. 
But if it's something that you feel comfortable going through, then I encourage you to continue to sit with those feelings, taking some deep breaths and feeling them. And it can be really helpful to simply try to name what it is you're feeling. Is it anger? Is it grief? Is it frustration? Whatever it is, just putting a name to it can be a way to start to help your body to actually process those feelings. Happy to answer uh, questions about that at the end as well. So just to summarize for this section in terms of the different strategies that we talked about in the area of mindset and stress management, um, it's the mindfulness of pieces in terms of taking three breaths Maybe it's three, maybe it's 10. But if you're someone who's really stress, uh, struggling with stress and anxiety these days, I encourage you to build that into your day as much as possible. Um, because this is a really good way to really try to calm that central nervous system and promote more of the parasympathetic um, pathway uh, activation rather than uh, the fight or flight mechanisms. And then self-compassion. So we, we went through this self-compassion break. Some people find it helpful to make a self-compassion playlist, whatever it is that speaks to you. Um, if you feel it's helpful, I encourage you to just build it into your day so that um, you're able to have these strategies to cope with the stress in your life. Journaling um, can be a really helpful thing as well. We don't have time to go into this in a lot of detail, but I just encourage you, if you're someone who enjoys writing, it can be really helpful to just simply write and express how you're feeling. Don't, you don't have to have a set goal, just writing down what you're feeling. Another op option in the, gra in the journaling world is a gratitude journal. And so this is what I actually do every morning as well after I have my self-compassion break. Then I write down at least three things that I'm grateful for. And I've been doing this for a month now since I went back to work um, after maternity leave. And it's been a really nice way to help me stay focused on the positive things during COVID and, and trying to manage working from home and everything um, that's been happening these days. And so I encourage you to just think about if there's any of these strategies that might fit into your day and, and to play with them and, and see how it makes you feel. And then this practice of self-care. So simply thinking about what brings you joy and then scheduling it into your life. Often we think of, oh, I'd like to take a bath or have a nice hot cup of coffee or tea by myself or just go and sit in the sunshine. Um, but unless we have it in our schedule, sometimes life gets so busy and, and uh, full and we don't actually sit down to take that time for ourselves. So I encourage you to come up with a regular self-care practice. And uh, if you're someone who needs a little bit of a hand with this, again, another plug here for that program. It's a free online program that we're starting May 12th, Coping During COVID. And uh, we'll be talking a lot more about self-care in the program. So to wrap up this section, I just want to uh, share this quote with you. A moment of self-compassion can change your entire day. A string of such moments can change the course of your life. And so now we'll move on to the nutrition component of uh, managing stress and anxiety. And so I'm sure we've, uh, people here are familiar with, obviously following the strict gluten-free diet is so important for people with celiac disease. And I encourage you to just think about how you can really make that a whole foods-based gluten-free diet. Having minimally processed foods um, as much as possible can be a really great way to, uh, to just build in that extra um, support and care for your system during extra stress these days. When supplies are out of stock, I know I've heard from different people all across the country where it's crazy some of the things that are sold out. And so when we go grocery shopping, just trying to go with um, some more uh, being patient and flexible and trying new things, maybe looking at more frozen options, um, those sorts of things so that we can um, still eat in a way that doesn't cause stress for us. A simple strategy in terms of uh, increasing fruits or vegetables and fiber into our daily life. Uh, I saw this on from a dietitian that I follow on Instagram, and I love it. It's called her two, three, four rule. So at breakfast, she aims to have two servings of vegetables. At lunch, three servings, and dinner, four servings. And um, and so if you're able to get all of those in, then by the end of the day, you've had quite a few, almost nine servings if you get up there. Um, and these again can be really helpful for um, gut health. And then I encourage you also to think about what makes you feel good, psychologically, emotionally, and physically um, after you eat it. And then focusing on trying to make the choices so that you're all optimizing all those areas. 
I'd also like to take this time, uh, Mark mentioned that uh, I'm a co-founder of the My Healthy Gut app. We just uh, this year published two studies over the last couple of years, um, one on the development of the app and then another on the randomized control that we trial that we ran. Um, and so this is a really good, uh, a great way if you're looking for extra support in managing celiac disease or just general gut health issues, you can start here with a free seven day trial. Right now it is only available on um, the iTunes store, but we're hoping to get some funding so that uh, we can build it out in the Android space as well. I, I'm really excited particularly about the food journal and symptom tracking function. It helps you to track all of these things and keep them all together and then you can actually create a health report to share with your healthcare provider. And uh, if you're really struggling with gut health, it can be helpful to um, identify patterns and triggers of digestive distress. And then this is just a little bit more information on that health report that's generated. So I encourage you to check out um, our app if you have time. And now moving on to sleep. So research suggests that aiming for at least out eight hours of night, eight hours of quality sleep a night is what people need. Um, and as someone with two young children at home, I definitely understand the exhaustion piece um, and tough sleeps all too well. But I have learned that the most important thing um, is to focus on what you can control, which is when you go to bed and, um, and then having a plan to help you actually fall asleep. So we'll talk about that shortly, but first I want to talk about just how stress affects our sleep. So when we feel stress, it leads to um, our bodies to produce increased cortisol. And although that can help us with this flight or fight response in, in coping with the stress, if this happens over the long term, it can reduce our immune function, reduce production of serotonin and melatonin, um, as well as our digestive processes. However, if we start to incorporate more of a healthy diet, get exercise, sleep, and meditation, that these are all strategies, as I've been talking about, that can help us to actually cope with the, whatever the stressor is. So that even if we're not reducing them, when we're encountering these stressors, it helps us to reduce the amount of activation that that vagus nerve gets. And we can reduce then the amount of cortisol that's released. Um, and so that we have more parasympathetic nervous system stimulation so we can rest and digest um, and have less pain as well. Um, and then we have better immune function, the, uh, neuro, the hormones that are produced, as well as improved gut function. So what are some simple strategies that we can use to improve our sleep? One of the top things is to have a sleep routine. And so I encourage you to think about, these are some of the evidence-based ones, um, but think about what works for you. What does your body need um, in order to have a good sleep? And so often it's, we need to turn electronics off at least one hour before bedtime. Sometimes it might even be two. I know for me, I need a long time to wind down. Um, same with ment mentally stimulating activities. Some people find it helpful to have a warm bath um, or engaging in some light reading or stretching. And of course that meditation piece. There's so many wonderful resources now um, that can help with um, uh, meditation in terms of apps um, and devices. So if you need a bit of support, check that, check those out. But um, great way is just simply the deep breathing exercises that I've taken you through today. And now let's touch on um, the exercise piece. And so overall, we want to be aiming for 30 minutes or or more a day of exercise and really focusing on what makes you feel good because that's what you're going to do. And so a couple of years ago, we started this Move C study. And so it was, an, it was a randomized controlled trial where we were looking to understand the relationship between the microbiome, vitality and exercise and celiac disease. So this was a 12-week exercise program. Um, and so we had two weekly exercise sessions and then bi-weekly holistic education sessions. Um, and we're just working on publishing our findings now, but this is the study protocol. If you'd like more information, it's been published in uh, Global Advances in Health and Medicine. And so this was a program where we had 33 inactive adults with celiac disease participate um, with us. And after the program, we found that those who did the intervention had significant improvements in waist circumference, resting heart rate, and body mass and then improvements in gluten-free diet adherence, self-compassion, and then their quality of life was sustained, whereas they, it got worse in the weight loss control group. 
So overall, the key takeaways from um, this research and all of the research out there, out there on exercise is that we really want to um, be active because if we can attain, the research shows that if attaining 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise is what we need to do to attain health benefits. Um, if you're someone who's completely sedentary, then it's obviously taking with, start, starting with baby steps there. It's one or two minutes or maybe five, wherever you can start from. That's, that's wonderful because anything you do will give you incrementally great uh, benefits and doing what you enjoy, what feels good for your body. Ultimately working up to 30 minutes or potentially more a day of just this regular activity. And um, it's also reducing our sedentary time. And so that's when we think about um, time on screens, we really wanna try to break that up so that we're not, um, not just sedentary because there are so many um, health consequences of having reduced activity and increased sedentary behavior. But I encourage you to take a couple of minutes now to think about what you enjoy um, and write down some things that you could do over the next week that uh, could incorporate more physical activity into your life if you are noting that, uh, that that's an area of your life that could um, use some, uh, that you could increase. So this is an example for me of what I typically do in terms of online classes or how I incorporate regular exercise into my life. So these are the different components um, of the self-compassion and uh, sorry, mindset, nutrition, sleep, and exercise. And I truly believe that these are all essential components of managing stress and anxiety. You might be someone who knows that there's other areas of your life, um, other strategies that, that work for you. And um, I encourage you to continue to use them. Um, and if you're someone who needs a bit more help, again, this is this Coping During COVID program. It's a four-week online program where we'll um, have these classes broadcast live once a week over four weeks. Um, and if you can't attend live, that's okay. They'll all be um, recorded so you can watch later. And then there'll also be yoga sessions as well. If you're interested, you can email us at guthealthbyyc at gmail.com. Um, and you don't have to be diagnosed with any specific uh, gut health issues, just people who are struggling. Um, it's really open to everyone. So thank you so much for your time, and I'm more than happy to answer questions now. Thanks, Justine. Before we jump into questions, I'll uh, do some more prize uh, giveaways. I think my video is on, but I'm not seeing myself. Manitoba Harvest uh, prides itself on the quality of hemp-based foods oils and supplements, a great addition to any meal. They're part of the gluten-free certification program. Ready to eat right out of the bag, hemp hearts have a slightly nutty taste, similar to sunflower seeds or pine nuts. And this prize pack is a 90 value. The winner is Adele McCaution from Calgary, Alberta. One degree organic foods produces sprouted brown rice crisps, corn flakes, maize and oats. Your prize pack includes four of their gluten-free products and a tote bag, a $35 value. The winner is Joy Ang from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Congratulations uh, to our winners. So Justine, uh, first question here. Uh, do you have any advice on mindfulness and coping strategies or resources for young children, like three to five years or maybe even a bit older? Yes, um, I, can, I can email out some resources as well. Um, it's not the age group that I typically work with, but I have a three-year-old at home. And um, one of the things that I really love to do with him is um, there's a book, uh, two different books, one called I Am Mindfulness and I Am Yoga. Um, and there's a nighttime I Am Yoga one. And uh, I find those really helpful just in terms of uh, winding down after a long day and uh, taking some deep breaths there. But there are lots of resources, so I can definitely share some um, as well afterwards, Mark. Okay. So this is a scenario. So say I'm at work, a newly diagnosed celiac, trying to participate in a potluck, and a colleague has made a casserole with gluten-free noodles, and they announced to everyone, I made a casserole that uh, Mark can eat. But through questioning, I find out they used like a shared stick of butter, the strainer for the pasta, they think, oh, yeah, it was thoroughly rinsed after we had gluten noodles in there. So you have to decline in front of everyone. You feel guilty. You know, people are murmuring about the drama queen. Uh, any advice for someone in this scenario? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it's so tough. And I'm sure all the celiacs out there are cringing, having been through very similar um, difficult situations. And um, Oh, it's, it's really tough. And I think that um, 
the big thing here would be setting yourself up for success here. And, um, and so often for these sorts of potlucks, I typically bring my own food. Um, sometimes I'll just eat before and say, you know what, I really appreciate it, but I'm just, I'm not hungry. I already ate. Thank you so much. Um, and often I'm still starving and, you know, go and eat something in the bathroom <laughs> later, but um, trying to eat before, especially if it's in your situation like that. Um, and just saying, you know, it's not you, but I just am so sensitive. I, I just can't eat um, anyone else's food. And I think it can be really helpful to, before you go into a situation like that, to what I say, what I call it is just ground yourself. And so um, to me, that means just sitting or standing and taking a couple of deep breaths and saying, okay, I deserve to feel well. I deserve to stand up for myself. I don't have to eat this. Um, anything I don't want to eat, anything I don't feel safe eating. And I think that if you, you know, just say, you know, I just get so sick. I can't take any chances. I'm so grateful that you did this um, and just be grateful, but uh, politely decline. And, uh, and yeah, but it's just really tough. I'm sorry that it sounds like you went through that. <laughs> well, this was not a question, but yeah, definitely you want to thank them and uh, offer to, you can offer to coach the next time. <laughs> People are genuine, genuinely want to help. <laughs> totally. Yeah repeat the two, three, four rule. And uh, if you can offer any creative ways of including vegetables with your breakfast, veggie omelets gets a bit old. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So the two, three, four rule, um, this is where this dietitian recommends like in order to get our kind of seven to nine servings of vegetables a day and to really have a lot of fiber in our diet, um, that at breakfast, you try to have two servings of vegetables at lunch, three servings and dinner, four servings. Um, Cause I know often at breakfast, you're not usually craving vegetables. So a couple of different ways that we've been creative with this. Um, when I make my gluten-free uh, oatmeal, especially for my boys, I'll often make like a big bake for the week of oatmeal. And then I incorporate uh, like rice to cauliflower in there and so that can be a way to get some vegetables and they don't even know it that and then I add the hemp hearts um, chia all these other different ways to get um, vegetables in there um, there's also different types of pancakes if you make more savory type ones that you shred them like shred up zucchinis excuse me like you would in a bread or um, muffins that sort of thing it can make them really moist and then uh, again moving away from the omelet side I often like to even saute up some maybe swiss chard or um, with onions and um, leeks just kind of switch it up every week mushrooms that sort of thing and uh, I pre-chop up a whole bunch of those on Sundays so that my husband and I have um, some veggies like that, maybe with some sweet potatoes, and then we have some eggs with those during the week um, in the morning. Thank you. Uh, someone is saying uh, they're a mother of five, uh, newly, di newly diagnosed as celiac and a new baby arriving Thursday. <laughs> How to balance a new baby, three kids or four doing school work uh, to work this exercise that you're recommending into her routine. She's just like, what do I do? <laughs> Be kind and gentle with yourself. You're about to have a baby. Are you referring just to exercise? Well, I mean, to balance or all of them in general too, but uh, in particular, it was mentioned exercise. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think if, you know, uh, if you're about to have a baby, uh, you've got to listen to your body and, and think about what, what feels good. And if that's just a walk around the block, that's amazing. Good for you. If, if that's just some gentle movements during the day, it's just really listening to your body is what's so, so important. Um, and then if, if it was about kind of the other activities, I'd honestly chew. You have so much on your plate right now. I would, I would definitely just choose one thing. And if there's one thing I could recommend, it would be this self-care piece. And just thinking of some tiny little thing that fills up your cup and finding some way to, even if it only is one minute, five minutes, um, to try to get that into your day so that you're filling up your cup so that you can bring the best version of yourself to take care of your beautiful kiddos um, and for your delivery to go as smoothly as possible as well. And uh, if you have more questions, you can definitely email me about it. <laughs> five children it can be tough to find time to think of yourself but you, absolutely you forget that, eh? yeah um, this will be our, our last question uh, there seems to be more and more anxiety out there like even beyond the COVID-19 pandemic is this linked to celiac disease is for, for celiacs is traditional medication the answer or exercise a diet change what would you recommend um I think there's kind of a lot of pieces there but um as Dr sorry, the neurologist this morning, he was saying that it's more depression that seems to be more common than anxiety, specifically in celiac disease. But I think in terms of coping with anxiety, um, it's uh, depending on how severe it is. I think that um, just 
looking at getting reaching out for help and that not being a sign of weakness it being a sign of strength and so if you're feeling really anxious i think one of the top things to do is to talk about it whether it's with a friend a partner a loved one um, or a healthcare professional because they can really help you um, i think to cope with those things or the feelings um in a in a way that helps you to process those feelings and and hopefully let them go um, and then I think asking yourself, like, what, what would feel good to me? Um, what helps me to feel less anxious? I know for me, if I haven't um, been active, just going for a run or walk, um, maybe doing some yoga, whatever it is, just, I think when we practice self-compassion, one of the key pieces is that we take the time to listen to what our heart needs, what our body needs. And so again, I think if you're someone who's really struggling with anxiety, it's often we're out of touch with what, what our body needs. Okay. So taking the time to listen to that. You know, COVID-19 has brought a lot of that to the fore. So uh, thanks, uh, Justine. Thanks for reminding us of how important it is to take care of ourselves and love ourselves, especially during this uh, very stressful time. Thanks for presenting to us. Thanks, Mark. My pleasure. All right. Uh, so uh, moving along, um, bringing up another celiac symptom. I've always been lucky that uh, migraines have not been a symptom from which I've suffered. In fact, I, I think migraines don't exist. It's all in your head. It's a joke, folks. It's a joke. Uh, one time, actually, I uh, really love to travel. I uh, visited the Soviet Union and went to a, a doctor there. And he said, what's wrong? My grain, I said. And in correction, he replied, that's our grain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're going to move into our uh, last break now, uh, sponsored by M&M Food Market. M&M Food Market offers a wide selection of expertly frozen food and delicious options for any mealtime, from appetizers and desserts to prepared meals and sides, M&M Food Market has you covered. 340 locations across Canada. You can visit your local store or shop online at mmfoodmarket.com for free same-day pickup. How do we create our jambalaya kit at M&M Food Market? With care, like you do at home. We use andouille sausage for authenticity and let the sauce simmer until it's bursting with flavor. Because every recipe, right from the start, is how do we create our pot roast at M&M Food Market? With care, like you do at home. We braise chuck for 10 mouth-watering hours after aging it for 21 days. Because every recipe, right from the start, is prepared with care. How do we create our recipes at M&M Food Market? With care, like you do at home. That means we've made our jambalaya kit with quality ingredients and no artificial colors or flavors. Authentic recipes call for andouille sausage, so that's all we use. We simmer the sauce until it's bursting with flavor. From Creole spices, veggies, and oil. Because every recipe right from the start is prepared with care. M&M Food Market.